thank you all for, for coming. Um, I'll go ahead and introduce Jonathan. Uh, Professor Jonathan Hood uh, got his PhD at Caltech in 2010 in quantum optics and then did a postdoc at Harvard in ultra cold quantum chemistry and joined uh, the Purdue chemistry and physics departments uh, last spring. So we're excited to have him here. And today is uh, seminar title is assembly of ultra cold molecules and optical tweezer arrays. Take it away, John. Thank Thanks. Can everyone hear me okay? Yeah, yeah sounds good. Great. Uh, yeah, thanks. Sorry, I changed the title of my talk uh, yesterday. Um, so I, I started in January. Um, I ha had my first kid in February, and then COVID hit in March, so I haven't actually had a uh, chance to meet people in this um, community, but I think there are a lot of uh, shared interests and techniques, so I'm, I'm very excited to get to know everybody. We are currently in the fifth floor of Brown in the chemistry building. Uh, that is just a, a temporary lab. Uh, our final lab is under renovation in the basement of Brown, um, expected hopefully to be finished in um, summer of, of next year. And in this talk, uh, I, I wanted to a, um, give more of an overview of the field of ultra-cold molecules, talk about um, the motivations, uh, applications, uh, and then I was going to talk a, about the common techniques, techniques that we'll be using. And then finally, uh, in the last part of my talk, I'll discuss uh, what we've been doing in the lab, um, what we are trying to build right now. So uh, I, I usually say that our goal in my lab is to have full quantum control over ultra cold molecules. Uh, I, I wanted to spend this first slide talking about what I exactly I mean by full quantum control, what I mean by um, ultra cold. So we're working with molecules. Uh, you have the electronic states on their left. Let me see, turn the PowerPoint, the uh, pointer on. So you have the electronic uh, states, which uh, in a temperature scale would be about something like 10,000 Kelvin. Uh, you have the, the vibrational states, which um, are separated by roughly terahertz, which is like 100 Kelvin. Then you also have the rotational states, um, which are at an energy scale more like 100 millikelvin. Um, and then finally, you have the lowest energy scale in a molecule, which is the, the uh, nuclear spin interaction with all the other spins, um, hyperfine structure. And that typically is around 50 microkelvin. And so at room temperature, molecules are in a, a, a vast, um, collection of, of these vibrational, rotational, and, and nuclear spin states. But our goal is, to be, is going to be to use these ultra-cold molecules um, as, a, a, uh, as a qubit or as a um, storage for, for a quantum state. And so we really do need control over all these degree of freedom so that we can put a molecule in a, a single quantum state, represent that internal quantum state by a single wave function. Um, which would represent, for example, like a, a zero or the one state in a, in a qubit. There is an additional degree of freedom of that molecule, which is the motional degree of freedom. And I think interestingly for a molecule, um, so molecules as a whole is either a fermion or a boson, it has a de Broglie wavelength. Um, at about 100 millikelvin, so over here, um, the, the de Broglie wavelength of a molecule uh, is about the same size as the molecule itself. And so if you're looking for any types of effects, any, any types of quantum effects um, with molecules interacting, you really need to be much colder than this temperature. Um, but a more relevant length scale for our experiments is going to be a um, length scale of maybe the interactions between two molecules, a Van der Waals interactions or a dipole-dipole interactions. Um, and for that, you're going to need to get to a temperature which is more like a microkelvin. Um, and just last year, there was an exciting result from Genius Group at Jilla, uh, the first uh, Fermi degenerate gas of polar molecules, molecules in their, in their row vibrational ground state. Um, and for there, um, you really need this ultra cold regime. Um, and I want to differentiate quickly this, this ultra cold regime from what we usually refer to as cold molecules, um, which is typically above a millikelvin. Uh, 
you can get cold molecules using common techniques in, in physical chemistry, um, buffer gas cooling. Um, in, in this ultra cold regime, you're really going to need to rely on laser cooling. Uh, so I wanted to uh, next talk about three main areas, three motivations for why we're working towards full quantum control over molecules. Uh, the first one, um, which I briefly wanted to mention, it's not something uh, that will be a focus of my research, but it was an early driving force into, into controlling these ultra cold and getting into this ultra cold regime, um, and that is uh, precision measurements. The, uh, the idea here is that you have, you have a molecule uh, that has, uh, for example, very large electric fields, uh, has electron accelerating very rapidly around it. And so you can kind of think of it as a, a small particle accelerator. And it turns out that molecules can be very good tests of the standard model of physics. Uh, there was a very exciting result from, from two years ago um, measuring the electric the electron dipole moment. So in the standard model of physics, it's, uh, electron does not have a dipole moment, um, but a lot of extensions predict some finite value. And, and by measuring, doing spectroscopy on thorium oxide, people, the acne collaboration has been able to start limiting, um, ruling out some of those uh, theories, like certain versions of supersymmetry. And what's really interesting is just in those last two years now, the, this, these experiments, uh, this experiment in particular, is putting tighter constraints on the standard model than, than LHC. Uh, so that's one very exciting um, direction for, for these cold molecules. The next one I wanted to talk about is uh, quantum chemistry. And here I've, I've drawn the uh, different features of a, a chemical, different ranges of a chemical reaction. You have on the left, uh, the asymptotic um, regime where the molecules are just uh, well separated. Um, there we can control, uh, we, we need to be able to control what these initial states are. Uh, then you have second, the, the long range interaction. There you have um, centrifugal barrier uh, due to the angular momentum of those molecules as they collide. You also have um, the dipole-dipole interactions uh, for, for dipolar molecules, uh, the van der Waals interactions. And then you also finally have the most complicated regime, which is in green, the, the short range interaction, which is this intermediate complex, which is notoriously difficult to calculate because you have multiple nuclei, uh, many electrons. And so a lot of theories that uh, right now are statistical um, in trying to predict what's happening here. So I wanted to first uh, start talking about how ultra-cold molecules uh, can contribute to this, the, the long-range um, interactions, the long-range part right there. Uh, so I'm writing now the potential, the centrifugal um, potential for, for two molecules interacting. You have um, L, which is just the, the relative angular momentum, uh, rotational angular momentum. And uh, when L is zero, we call that, we refer to that as an S wave scattering. When L is one, we refer to that as a P wave scattering. And in most reactions, the, the temperatures are far too high for, for any of these to play a, a, a very important role. But when you get down to temperatures below, say, 100 microkelvin, uh, then the, the centrifugal barrier um, can play a very important role. Uh, as I'll, I'll show in a, a, uh, an experiment that was done. Um, and in this regime, when we are in this re uh, regime, then we can start imagining using these long range potentials to actually control whether or not the reaction happens. And so if we have a barrier, a barrier um, there, then the reaction won't take place. And there was, um, so, we refer to this as the single, uh, uh, single partial wave collision regime where we are just referring to um, where one partial wave is dominating the, the reactions rates. And so a, a great experiment uh, example of this was done um, with KRB in, in 2014, 2010, sorry. Um, and that is you have ultra cold uh, KRB, potassium rubidium. KRB is a, a fermion. Um, and so if you have, I'm hearing a guitar in the background, I'm not sure if somebody accidentally has their, uh, 
their mic on. So uh, KRB is a, a fermion. Uh, if you have two identical KRB, uh, then the, the total wave function has to be anti-symmetric. And, and that means that this, uh, the angular momentum, the relative rotational angular momentum between them has to be um, anti-symmetric which requires that this L here cannot be zero, it has to be one. Uh, and when you have an L equals a P wave collision, then you get this barrier here. And if you were cooled down to below 100 microkelvin roughly, then this barrier is really important and this barrier can turn off the reaction. And now if we just go in there and we maybe make uh, one of those KRB molecules um, distinguishable, we say flip maybe a hyperfine spin in one of them, then these two molecules are distinguishable and they can undergo S wave collision when L equals zero, there's no barrier, and then that rate can happen a lot, uh, a lot faster. And this is turning on and off a reaction just due to the quantum statistics. This is a very, uh, very non classical result. And this was the experiment done in 2010 where you have on the y axis, you have a decay rate coefficient of KRB molecules interacting, uh, reacting with each other. You have um, the case where they are indistinguishable, so the, the two fermions are in the same state, and you see a very suppressed reaction rate which scales up with temperature. It scales with temperature just because the reaction can still happen uh, because of quantum tunneling through this barrier. But if you flip one of the spins of, a, uh, of one of the KRB molecules, then they are distinguishable, they can undergo S wave collisions, and then you see about a two order of magnitude increase in the reaction rate. And so using these long range interactions, we can imagine controlling the, uh, these long range interactions, we can imagine controlling the reaction rates. And a great example of that is we can uh, apply electric fields to induce dipole moments uh, in our reactants. Uh, this is on the left over here, you have the case with the molecules with the P-wave barrier, which I was just talking about. But if you apply an electric field here, then the molecules will orient themselves along the electric field. And depending on the relative orientation between them, you can either in, uh, suppress or enhance that reaction. And that was shown uh, in two experiments, two notable experiments, uh, one in 2010, and, and again, uh, Debbie Jen and Junie's group, where they have a reaction rate, they, they turn on the dipole moment by applying an electric field, and they can see now as they, they let this, um, this way for the molecules to go uh, across this barrier, they see the reaction rate dramatically increase. Uh, more recently in um, Dijon Wang's group uh, with sodium rubidium, they've turned up the electric dipole moment here and they've seen a stepwise increase of the reaction rate. And that's just as more partial waves are, are entering the picture, you get an increase in the reaction rate there. So as a um, final part of this, uh, of, of studying reactions, I'll talk about this intermediate complex um, regime, which is the hardest regime to, to calculate. Um, one way people have studied this over, uh, over the last 10 years is through scattering resonances. And so if you have an incoming energy of the molecule, if it's resonant with one of the uh, bound states or quasi bound states of the intermediate complex, then you can get scattering resonance where your reaction rate is, is, is significantly enhanced. And this of course plays an important role in at high temperature reactions, but when you get into this ultra cold regime, even the cold regime, you, you can start, uh, these, these resonances become much more narrow and you can start identifying individual resonances. And this is an excellent way to test our ab initio calculations of this intermediate complex. And so, uh, the scattering resonances probe the short brain potential energy surface. Uh, and this was shown, uh, a great example was shown uh, last year in the PAN group uh, in China where uh, with sodium potassium uh, interacting with potassium, uh, sodium potassium being in its, in its ground state, or vibrational ground state, um, they showed uh, multiple resonances between um, this molecule and this atom. Uh, which can then be compared to the ab initio calculations. And so there's a more direct way, there's a very recent res uh, result from my group, um, the knee group at Harvard where I did my postdoc, um, 
a new technique, which uh, is to do direct spectroscopy on all these intermediate complex states. And this has been done before with ultrafast spectroscopy because typically these intermediate complexes are live, live for around picoseconds. But in an ultra cold regime, you are, you are going to be limiting the number of, of states severely. And so you can actually get very long, relatively long interaction times. Uh, in the case of KRB in the knee group, it was about 100 nanoseconds. And so that's long enough to do spectroscopy just with CW light um, with, uh, on these intermediate complexes. And uh, this year or last year, there was the first um, direct observation of this intermediate complex for these robot vibrational, these bialkali um, collisions, uh, which they observed with mass spectroscopy. Um, and then there's, they observed a K2RB2 um, ion. And finally, the, another way to, to analyze um, this reaction is just to do spectroscopy on the outgoing products where really you want state detection. And they're also, um, we were, people are also able to detect in this ultra cold regime exactly what quantum states are coming out and then compare that to um, theories, for example, the, uh, the RRKM theory that predicts is a statistical model for predicting what um, the lifetime of this complex and some other theories of predicting um, what these outgoing products are. And so it's a great way to test some of these um, short range um, theories since nobody can actually calculate this. So the next part of my talk, uh, the, the next part of the application I want to talk, the last one, um, is, is using molecules for quantum information. And I want to start this section by at least, by, um, by at least admitting that there are, there, are many, uh, there are many qubits to choose from right now. And so a very good question is uh, why ultra-cold molecules? Ultra-cold molecules haven't actually been realized as, as, as a quantum gate. And so why are we going to all this trouble to uh, use ultra-cold molecules as a quantum gate? What, what extra things does it bring to the story? And here, the real advantage for, for, the, for these molecules uh, is their electric dipole moment. And now neutral atoms, neutral atoms have a, a magnetic dipole moment. Um, but if you just take the ratio of the, um, of the electric dipole moment, the typical electric dipole moment to a magnetic dipole moment, um, the electric dipole moment is, is about four orders of magnitude larger. And so uh, if you, to be a little bit more quantitative, quantitative if you took um, two molecules, the one I'm going to be working with is lithium cesium, has a dipole moment of 5.5 of .5 divided by straight separated those molecules by about a half a micron, which is a, a typical distance if you're trapping them in a lattice or in tweezers. Um, that corresponds to an interaction rate of 40 kilohertz. Now, compared to some other systems, you might not think 40 kilohertz is really large. Um, for example, in, in Rigberg systems, uh, you can get in uh, kilodivide dipole moments. Uh, but there's a really important distinction that I want to emphasize here with molecules, and that is this interaction takes place in the electronic ground state in the rotational states of the molecules. And so it's this extra degree of freedom that molecules have, these rotational states that we're going to be taking advantage of. And so the rotational states scale with the uh, rotational quantum number n squared. And this uh, separation is it goes with the uh, just the inverse of the moment of inertia, which is in constant b, and that's typically on the order of gigahertz. And so that means these molecules can be, I have the first three rotational states here, that these molecules can be manipulated with, with very precise microwaves. And that is in stark contrast with, for example, Rydberg atoms, where in order for them to interact, you have to excite the atoms into uh, a, a, a excited short-lived Rydberg state usually live on the order of microseconds. And a really fair comparison for this system and, in, and any other system is this interaction time divided um, by the, the coherence time of, of, of your quantum bit. And for a molecule, you are in the, we're going to be in the rho vibrational ground state, rotational vibrational ground state. Um, the uh, the molecules, in my case, we pinned so they can't react with each other. 
uh, there's nowhere else for the molecules to decay to, to. So really the limitation for these molecules is just black body radiation, um, which can excite a molecule from one vibrational level to another, to typically like a terahertz apart. And that time scale has been predicted uh, for lithium cesium, the molecule I'll work with, to be about 60 seconds. And so if you divide this inter one, over, one over this interaction time divided by the, um, the 60 seconds, you get about a, about a million interaction times. And so that's why we're excited about it. A, uh, another limitation, of course, with, with these experiments where we trap in light is collisions with the background gas. But that collision with the background gas is also going to be on the order of 60, 60 seconds, the time that you can trap a single molecule. Um, which is just getting down to something like uh, a few times 10, uh, about 10 to the minus 10 torr. Uh, rec a record, I think, for holding a, a neutral atom is around 300 seconds. And so those are kind of the natural time scales. But even those in, the, in a future experiment, uh, we, those can be overcome by um, putting the experiment uh, around, uh, if just cooling down the experiment, not to a very low temperature, but even something like 100 Kelvin. Um, will significantly enhance both these rates. And so that's why we're, that's why I in particular am, am very interested in um, pursuing these molecules for both quantum uh, computation and, and quantum simulation. But for both of those, I wanted to spend a little bit of time to uh, go over exactly how these interactions occur in molecules. Uh, I think this, I'm gonna give one illustrative example that will I think hopefully uh, help you understand uh, what would we be doing in the case of, of maybe forming a gate or having the molecules in an array where they can all interact with each other um, to form some type of quantum simulation. We again have these rotational states of the molecule and the rotational states can be represented by these spherical harmonics which are the uh, orientation of the dipole moment of the molecule. And if you look at any of these spherical harmonics, you notice that if you average all the different directions of the dipole moment, they all average to zero. And so an important point uh, with these molecules is that pure rotational states have no electric dipole moment. So they don't actually interact. That's actually quite convenient for, for the schemes that I'll, I'll talk about a little bit, because that means you can turn off the interaction uh, the, the molecules will only interact if you want them to interact. And so that means they can also be really good at storing quantum information for a long period of time. Uh, so how do you get the molecules to interact? Uh, the answer is by having superpositions of these states. If you, if you take a superposition of n equals zero and n equals one state, and then you average a dipole moment, you will get, you will find that the, the dipole moment now has an orientation. Um, one way to mix that is just by applying an electric field. So if we apply an electric field, that will cause a mixing of, of the zero and this one state. Uh, they both get stark shifted. And now we have an orientation of a dipole moment. You have a, a, a dipole going down, a dipole pointing up. And this, this mixing can occur in a number of different ways. It can occur by applying an electric field. Um, it can also occur by just dressing these states with a, with a microwave. Um, a, either a resonant or a non-resonant microwave. And there was a proposal in 2002 by, by Dave DeMille at Yale uh, about how to use these molecules in a quantum computation architecture. The one that were, there's been a lot of proposals since, but I think this one is, is maybe the easiest to understand, which is why I wanted to um, quickly discuss what's going on. You have this linear array, this 1D lattice of molecules. You're applying a very strong electric field, typically on the order of kilovolts per centimeter. And the, therefore, all the molecules will have a, a permanent dipole moment. Um, if you consider the molecules by themselves, then um, they have, they're, they're shifted, they have some resonance between these frequencies, uh, between these states, which you can address with a microwave. You, you don't want to address all the molecules at the same time. And so you can play a couple tricks to make them individually addressable. Um, in, in this proposal, they have a, a um, linear gradient on the electric field so that it gets larger as you move along here. That means all the states are shifted differently. And that means with the microwave, you can address each one. 
Um, in, in a proposal that uh, we're pursuing, you can also do this by just applying an optical Stark shift um, with, with the tweezer, and then you can uh, change, say, if you have one molecule or two molecules that you want to interact, you can shift all the other molecules out of resonance, and so you're really just talking to one or two. Um, and, and so uh, in this proposal, the, the molecules are individually addressable, but if you have two molecules that are neighboring, um, then they will interact. Their dipole moments will shift each other, and, and that means that the, uh, if you drive one of these molecules, it will uh, depend on whether what the state of the, the neighboring molecule, which is the, the basis of, of a gate. There's been, um, this was in 2002, uh, so again, in molecules, this has, this has not been realized yet, and I'll talk later when I discuss techniques on, on why that's the case and why I think this new system that we're building will, um, will be great for this. Uh, there have been a lot of other proposals. Um, when you consider all the experimental, deal, uh, experimental details, I think these are a little bit more realistic. Um, Susan Yellen, propose a kind of analog of a Rigberg blockade gate. Um, there's been gate uh, proposals by, the, by Peter Zoller's group of you know, using molecules coupled to superconducting qubits, um, superconducting wires, and using the molecules as um, storage and also interactions through that superconducting wire. Um, Sabre Kaisen, our, our uh, at Purdue has also had a number of proposals on how to use molecules. In particular, there's one here um, that you can use symmetric top molecules, which are which are easier to work with actually because they're they polarize quicker and so you don't need as large of uh, electric fields. There, in the last uh, two years, there's been a proposal by our group uh, at Kanquin Needs Group um, at Harvard at um, the Imperial and Durham groups. Uh, on uh, considering the the full structure of these of these row vibrational ground state molecules, and a really important th these were two different analysis, uh, slightly different gates, but really the conclusions were the same, and the techniques, uh, the the method end up being the same. One and first one important point um, that they both brought up was that uh, in in the lab, an electric field is pretty hard uh, to to control very accurately. And so both of these proposals get rid of that electric field. Um, they just rely on a, uh, a microwave and, and a magnetic field, which we can control to, in our lab, um, 10 parts per million. Uh, and so then, then your experiment's only sensitive, really only thing interacting with is your microwave, your magnetic field, and, and, this, and this trap light. Um, and so in that case, you, you can get much better coherence. Uh, the other really important point to come out of these two analyses of, of using uh, molecules as a quantum gate is that the hyperfine structure plays in a really important role. And so this is a calcium fluoride. Um, uh, there's a little separation here separating the n equals zero uh, to the n equals one state, uh, which are separated um, by, in this case, 20 gigahertz. And um, there, there is a lot of um, of these hyperfine states even more in, um, in the bioalkalis. And in order to separate these hyperfine states, you need to apply a large magnetic field um, in order to distinguish them. Uh, if they're degenerate, then it's going to be very difficult to have a two-level system because you can off you're going to be coupling to multiple hyperfine states. Uh, so in both these proposals, you apply a large magnetic field, um, and then you can just use microwaves to uh, manipulate the uh, zero and the one rotational states. Um, if you have nearby molecules, then, then um, they'll have an exchange interaction, and this can be used as the basis of a gate. Um, in, in our proposal in the knee group, um, we were is based on a tweezer architecture system where these tweezers, as I'll describe later, you can we can reconfigure and move these tweezers around in real time, so you can just actually bring two molecules together, have them exchange, have an exchange interaction, and then pull them apart. And, and this can also be used to, uh, as an ice swap gate. Um, so both of them universal quantum gates. What I found really interesting is that both of these proposals ended up getting a very similar, uh, even though they used slightly different techniques, they ended up getting very similar predictions for uh, fidelities for both these molecules. And that is considering um, all, all, 
all the different noise sources that we think will be important. Um, you have inaccuracy of the microwave, which is kind of trivial because the microwave sources are so accurate nowadays, a stability of the magnetic field, um, black body radiation doesn't play much of a role. Uh, probably the, the biggest source of decoherence is, is the um, dependence of the states on the trapping light. Uh, but there's even uh, tricks now on how to, to make this these two states here um, magic, meaning that they are um, they shift the same in your trapping light. Um, or you can maybe imagine uh, doing it in the blue-to-tune trap, blue-to-tune lattice, where they're insensitive, more insensitive to the trapping light. So, John. Yes. Excuse me, I have a question. So, yes. sorry, I'm, I missed your early part. The early part of your talk, I was in my class. Yes. So, okay, what is the advantage here of using magnetic field instead of using an electric field? It seems that you want to get rid of the electric field. Yes. Um, yeah, I didn't. I didn't really explain. Um, it, it's it's somewhat technical. Uh, it, it's a lot harder to have a stable electric field um, in in an experimental environment. Uh, you need to have electrodes that are very close to your atoms. Uh, the magnetic field can be made with coils that are very far away, and there's just more techniques for stab stabilizing the magnetic field. Um, the electric field, if you use a large electric field, you can induce typically larger dipole moments, and so you can get a faster interaction time. And that's actually what I noticed previously, I was saying the interaction time is more like 40 kilohertz, whereas this interaction time for both these proposals is more like one millisecond, so significantly slower. But what we found is that that actually doesn't matter too much because uh, one of the limitations in these proposals are is off resonant scattering to all these different hyperfine structures. And so if you have a really fast pulse, you are gonna more likely off resonantly scatter to these, uh, excite these different hyperfine states here. And so the slow gate time of one millisecond um, using a smaller dipole moment um, is actually an advantage. I see. System. Yeah, thanks. Mm -hmm. Sure. So, um, Finally, so I've been focusing a, on uh, quantum computation. Uh, maybe a more fruitful short-term goal in this field is um, more in the line of, of, of quantum simulations. Uh, there's the quantum gas microscope with neutral atoms coming out of um, a lot of different groups. And the, uh, the atoms can hop around in an optical lattice. Uh, there's been a lot of uh, great physics come out of that. One, dis one um, limiting factor in this in, in this system is that the atoms can interact. The atoms interact very weakly, um, usually through a contact interaction, uh, where the where the atoms uh, interact through a short range Van der Waals um, force, and they have to be on top of each other. Um, if we there's a lot of interesting systems we want to study that have important dipole dipole interactions, and so a natural extension to these quantum gas microscopes with neutral atoms. Uh, is is a quantum gas microscope with with molecules, uh, and so this would be a Hubbard model with dipole dipole interactions, sometimes called an extended extended Hubbard model, um, and th this is something that we are we're working towards. And there's been um, a, a few other proposals um, where, in, in these cases, imagine that you have an, a lattice of molecules, but those lattices are pinned down, um, so they can't hop. Uh, Peter Dole proposed um, showed in 2006 um, for a, a double molecule that it, uh, these polar lattice uh, array of these uh, polar molecules is actually a very general um, lattice uh, quantum spin simulator um, and that you can do pretty arbitrary quantum spin models in this um, by just using uh, different um, dressing of all those rotational states. Uh, there's also been predictions um, by Alexei Gorshkov's group and, and Anna Maria's Ray's group of, of these uh, arrays of, of dipolar molecules um, having topological phases. And so there'd be a lot of interesting things to explore once you have a uniformly filled array of, of molecules. And when I talk later about the technique, so I'll, I'll describe um, why, why that has been very difficult and why hopefully this new strategy that we're using um, with, with an optical tweezer array, uh, actually a hybrid optical tweezer array with lattice um, will hopefully uh, make this more feasible. So that's the uh, kind of the end of my the first part of my talk, which is the motivation. Um, the this next part of my talk is is about the techniques 
that we're going to be using, um, what has been done so far, what my group plans to do. There is, um, I wanted to start this off by, by mentioning a previous uh, method in, um, in physical chemistry for getting, for studying cold molecules. Uh, is this is crossed molecular beam spectroscopy, um, which W. Hirschbach won the Nobel Prize for in 1986. More recently, uh, Ed Narevicius's group in the Wiseman Institute has um, had created new techniques where you actually adiabatically merge, not adiabatically, but you, you merge the two beams with quadrupole guiding. And then in the relative frame of these molecules, you can get down all the way to 10 millikelvin. Um, so uh, this new approach that in this ultra cold regime, we're gonna rely instead on, uh, so, sorry, this, uh, this technique here to get cold relies on a, a combination of buffer gas cooling where you cool the molecules by, uh, by having collisions with, with a cold atom, a cold molecule um, and a buffer gas, and also um, on the supersonic expansion. Um, so in this new approach I'll be talking about, we're gonna be borrowing techniques from laser cooling um, from the field of AMO. And uh, I think it's funny that it's AMO because that molecular part really hasn't been a focus because I think uh, it's just been a little too intimidating and, until, uh, until recently to, to tackle these molecules where when it's now recently it's becoming uh, more popular, a lot more groups are starting to try uh, this direct cooling or um, assembling of these molecules. But it's all based on this, the fundamental principles of laser cooling, which is over here you have absorption of a, of a photon which has a momentum H bar K. Uh, when it absorbs, it slows. And then when it randomly, uh, when it spontaneously emits in a random direction, um, then on average, it doesn't uh, heat it back up in that direction. So you can get cooling. And the limitation in this cooling techniques is just, is just the recoil energy of a single photon. And that recoil energy is really small. That's, that's less than a micro Kelvin um, for, most, for most atoms that we're dealing with um, and molecules. And so just from laser cooling, um, by having a narrow uh, a line laser that we can um, put on uh, detune from specific transitions, we can, we can get down to this micro Kelvin energy. So that's the fundamental idea. But if you, if you take something that's room temperature and you calculate how many photons does it take to get it all the way down to this micro Kelvin temperature, the answer is about 10,000 photons. And so you need to be able to scatter 10,000 photons and here I have a two-level system, and the reason laser cooling works for something that behaves like a two-level system is because you excite it and then it comes back down to the state that you started it in so that your laser cooling light can then scatter another photon, and you can repeat that process many times to, to get sufficient cooling. I put here the level structure of cesium um, because I wanted to emphasize uh, that this does not work for a lot of atoms, a lot of molecules, most molecules. Uh, in cesium, in the alkalis and even alkaline earth, we're really lucky because uh, we have these transitions. Uh, for example, this is cesium. We have the ground state, the 6s, and then we have the 6p excited states up here. And we have a transition here which um, goes from a total spin uh, F4 up to F5. And we have these nice selection rules so that that 5 can only decay back down to this 4. And that means we can cycle many, many photons and do, and, and do very efficient cooling with these, even if maybe in one in a thousand go down to this uh, F equals three state down here, we can just have a, a weak repumper to get it back into the cycling transition. And so that's why laser cooling works really well uh, in, in these alkali atoms is, is that they have a simple level structure. But how does this become complicated when we have molecules? And so this is the basis of a MOT, which show here just because we're making this in the lab right now. Um, this is an example of a, a MOT right there, uh, about 100,000 atoms. And uh, so here I've drawn now the, the Born-Oppenheimer potentials for a molecule. Um, if you remember from that first slide, we have the um, vibrational states. We have um, also, the rotational states, if you zoomed in on a particular vibrational state, you have a series of rotational states. And so our level structure is getting a lot more complicated in molecules. And 
uh, in particular, vibrational states are really going to hurt us because uh, say we start off and somehow get to this row vibrational ground state. If we excite it to a V equal to vibrational state up there, then this vibrational state can decay to, to a lot of these different vibrational states. It's determined by something we call the, the Franconin factor, which is really just a wave function overlap between these vibrational states and these vibrational states. And in principle, these are not diagonal, so you can get decay to a lot of vibrational states. So for the condition for direct cooling of a molecule is that your Franconin factor is very close to one. Uh, this has been done with a handful of molecules so far. Um, 2018 was a really big year. There was um, sub-Doppler cooling schemes uh, of strontium fluoride and calcium fluoride in the Yale Harvard and the Imperial College groups. Um, this is also, we've now, uh, Junia Jilla has a, a, a mott of a terbium oxide. And uh, now John Doyle at Harvard is working on even doing polyatomic molecules. And when you're searching for a molecule to cool, you, you're, you're searching for ones that have very diagonal Franconin factors in your molecules um, where the electron, uh, one of the electron is hanging out um, with the strontium or the calcium out of it. It really behaves kind of like an alkali. And so that's why it's possible in these molecules. Um, this is a scheme for calcium fluoride, and it does become more complicated than that cesium picture I drew. You just, the, the answer is, uh, you maybe get 98% that Franconin factor is diagonal on 98%, and then all these other places that it could tell you decay to, you just need me more repumper layers. And so just the level of complexity of the experiment goes up quite a bit, especially since you now need to, I, I'm just talking about vibrational, you also have uh, rotational states that you need to address. And, um, a lot of these laser cooling techniques have taken a while to, um, to rethink in order to make it work for, for these molecules. And wanted to quickly point out that there are, there are alternative approaches um, to get to these temperatures um, without laser cooling, in particular um, Gerhard Rempe at MPQ is working on this uh, centrifugal decelerator, which, which works generally for, for, for molecules, more general molecules, just to have um, magnetic dipole moments. Uh, so there's another approach uh, for creating these um, row vibrational, ultra cold row vibrational ground states, and that is molecular assembly. Three atoms at uh, uh, an acetotic line. And so, in principle, we could be able, we could try to take the atoms from uh, very close to this asymptote, the near threshold, all the way down to this row vibrational ground state. And, but this is about 6,000 Kelvin. So this is a very large energy uh, to overcome. The earlier experiments relied on, on photo association where you just have one laser you expect to, to some vibrational states that then has a, uh, some non-zero non uh, Franconic factor with the ground state. And, and that has worked very, fairly well. Um, Particular some early experiments by the Bigelow group, sodium cesium. Uh, there's an experiment here at Purdue with lithium rubidium by, um, by Young Chen and Dan Elliott, um, where they were able to get about 300 molecules per second. Uh, a, a disadvantage of this technique is that the, the rate of molecule creation is fairly slow, um, just because there's not really states up here that have a very large Franconin factor with, with this row vibrational ground state. Uh, so there is an alternative approach. Uh, imagine that we try to do this whole thing coherently. Um, in practice, what they, uh, what they do is they associate these free atoms into Feshbach molecules using uh, sweeping a magnetic field over a Feshbach resonance. It's just a very loosely bound molecule that makes this process easier. And then you have two laser pulses that are uh, using intermediate excited state to go down coherently, um, it's adiabatic, all the way down to this row vibrational ground state. Uh, and process uh, called stimulated, stimulated passage or stereo. And this was done in 2008. I think this is an example of uh, a um, experimental technique which ended up working a lot better than maybe some people um, would have thought. Stereop is now done regularly with 99% efficiency. And, and this works very well. I think it's interesting that this technique came out of a lab um, where the uh, frequency comb and, and some of the most stable cavities were made. 
Those were necessary because in order for this to work, you have to have two lasers of very different wavelengths. And KRB, it was something in um, 600 and something, uh, 900 and 600 nanometers approximately. Uh, you have to have those two different wavelengths that are uh, locked within kilohertz of each other because that's, that's the uh, transition line width for this. Uh, and so now the stair app is pretty standard. It's been done in a lot of different molecules, KRB in 2008, um, but it's been done in a lot of other bioalkalis. Since then, in particular, our work at, at, at Harvard now has row vibration, row vibrational ground state, sodium cesium. Uh, our experiment was, was noticeably different than all of these others um, because it was done in a tweezer array. And I will talk a little bit of that, uh, in a, I'll talk about that in a little bit and the advantage of this, uh, of this approach, the disadvantage, um, how it's motivating our, our, our approach at, Harp, at a Purdue with lithium cesium. Um, I, so here is a, a chart, a, a periodic table where all the, the atoms in blue are the ones that have been trapped. And so a limit of, a limit of this assembly approach is that we have to use atoms um, that are that can be laser cooled. And of course, there's a lot of important atoms that are that not on this. And so that's, that's one limit um, for this approach. But if your interest is really just to get a very large dipole moment, if you want to do quantum simulation, quantum computation, uh, then, then these are actually fine. Um, the, the first molecule, KRB, has a very small dipole moment, 0 0.2 to by. Um, that interaction speed goes with the dipole moment squared. Um, what we worked with at Harvard was, was 4.6 dipole um, Dubai. The largest out of any of these combinations is lithium cesium, which has 5.5 Dubai. It has not been uh, has not been created in the road vibrational ground state coherently, um, and that's what we're going to be working on. There are uh, there are a lot of groups who are trying to uh, do other combinations. These are all bialkali. There are groups who are trying to do alkali or plus alkali. Those have turned out to be really hard um, due to a lack of Feshbach resonances. There are even groups now thinking about doing chromium and alkali. Uh, in our lab, we're going to be doing lithium cesium because it has a very large dipole moment and it has some other properties at the end, which I which I'll mention, uh, which I'm very excited about. But Lithium cesium has, has not been cooled to the ground state, and that's not for a lack of trying. There are, uh, lithium cesium has been worked with now a lot by, by two groups, um, the Vita Mueller group at Heidelberg and Chen Ching's group at Chicago. Um, and it has played, uh, lithium cesium has played an important role in, in FMA physics. Um, so in these groups in 2014, they had the first observation of multiple FMOF states just because the, uh, the this large mass difference between lithium and cesium contributes to uh, a smaller scaling constant in this FMOF that it's 2017 uh, in uh, I think a paper that Chris Green was involved in um, one of these uh, they did some tests on FMOF University and show universality and showed some deviation based on the flesh box strength and 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 Vita Miller's group in particular has thought a lot about how to go to the row vibrational ground state and are not really interested anymore. Lithium cesium using the standard approach um, is, is particularly difficult. And I want to next describe why this, uh, why the approach has been taken so far um, is challenging. The reason, so the approach so far uh, is to take the, the individual atoms. Um, in case of KRB, you have um, rubidium, cloud of rubidium atoms, a cloud of potassium atoms, and you need to overlap them uh, you need to get extremely high densities, and then you need to overlap these two species uh, before doing your uh, magneto association and your stair app process. And for for some molecule, for some combinations, in particular lithium cesium, this is really difficult. Um, either because the lithium and the cesium um, they have a very large mass difference, and so they don't want to be at the same position due to something like gravi gravitational sag. Or because if if the uh, if the degenerate gases have different properties, they just might not want to be on top of each other. And uh, but I showed um, earlier with the quantum simulations an array of uh, uniformly filled molecules, and that that really is the goal. That is what we are going to want to the point we need to get to before we can start using this um, as a, a quantum gas microscope with molecules. 
or even if we want to do a quantum gate, we need to reliably trap molecules in, in whatever site that we want. Uh, and in this scheme, in order to get 100% filling fraction, it requires that you get to extremely low temperatures in both the atoms and the molecules that you create afterwards, deeply in the, in the degenerate regime. And this has been difficult in atoms. It is particularly difficult with molecules. Uh, this is a, a KRB uh, paper from 2013 where they have a molecules in a lattice. They were able to observe uh, the interactions, uh, dipolar interactions, but this was over average over many different um, experiments. There's only about, had so far as about a 30% filling fraction in an optical lattice. Uh, and so these effects, you can see some oscillation, um, some Ramsey like spectroscopy. Uh, but these effects are uh, averaged over a lot of different situations, a lot of different configurations of these molecules. And so we really do need to get to this 100% filling fraction, near 100% filling fraction. Uh, so one other strategy besides getting really cold atoms initially is why not, once you have the molecules, uh, is just do some type of cooling on those molecules because uh, standard approach is once you, once you get uh, deeply into the degenerate regime, you can get a insulator state where you have a molecule at, at, at every different lattice site. And that also has been really hard. So usually to get to these temperatures, uh, we've used evaporative cooling where you just have a cloud of, of molecules. They are thermalizing with each other and the hot ones get knocked out either through just lowering the trap or I'm exciting them with, with RF spectroscopy. With molecules, it's really different. Uh, difficult, and I think this is an interesting story here. Um, they started the first molecule um, that in the row vibrational ground state was KRB, as I've mentioned, and they unfortunately found when they had a dense cloud of KRB that was pretty much universal, uh, a, a unity reaction rate. Whenever KRB and KRB uh, came together, they reacted with each other. And the uh, um, Prediction there, the, the hypothesis at that point was, well, KRB is, is a reactive molecule, meaning it can um, dissociate into to products. Well, why not we just use a, a molecule that is non-reactive, um, endothermic, so there's no products that uh, it can decay to. And that is what every group uh, since has, has tried doing. Um, that's gone to the road vibrational ground state. All those other molecules are non-reactive. Unfortunately, that didn't end up solving the problem. The reaction rates were very similar um, to the KRB case. And there was a proposal by the Bone Group, John Bone's group, that maybe this is sticky collisions, meaning the molecules, they come together. A um, series of Feshbrock resonances causes them to stick for a very long time, long enough for a third body to come in the story, and they can react that way. Um, you need three bodies because there's, there's no way to conserve energy and have two bodies. Um, because it's in the lowest energy state. Uh, there, it was determined later that that calculation, uh, there was actually some mistakes in that calculation, and, and the rates for that are far too low to explain what's happening. Uh, and the, what ended up being the, the, uh, um, the culprit for this, these very high reaction rates in all bialkali molecules so far is just photoexcitation of the intermediate state, which was proposed by Tish Karman um, last year. And now, uh, just this year, it's been confirmed by two groups. You have, for example, in, in, in Ken Quinney's group, you have KRB plus KRB. Um, they react to form intermediate complex for a couple hundred nanoseconds, but that is plenty of time for the trapping light itself to excite it to a, some other state which can dissociate. And that's pretty unfortunate for this approach uh, because if you're trying to evaporate your molecules to get to this deeply degenerate regime so you can have a uniformly filled lattice, then you can't trap them in, uh, with, with uh, light. Uh, magnetic traps can't really get to high enough densities. And so, uh, Really, the only way around this is going to be to, to have the atoms um, controlling these long range, these dipole dipole interactions to shield the molecules so that they can't react in the first place. And that's actually just uh, a good example that came on the archive last week by Juni's group showing that they could get about a, a factor of 100 to 1 in um, uh, elastic to inelastic. And so they might be able to start 
uh, evaporated cooling their molecules. I want to now start talking about this alternative approach that, which is what we pursued at uh, in Harvard. And I can see I have about five minutes left. Uh, I might skip parts of the section, but here we are going to use a different approach instead of just having large clouds of these atoms uh, that we cool down uh, to very low temperatures. We are going to instead use optical tweezers to trap individual atoms and then eventually molecules. And so we have an optical tweezer that we're focusing down to a tight spot. Uh, it was shown by uh, the Grandier group uh, in Paris um, that if you have a diffraction limited uh, optical trap, uh, then an atom will go into that trap and will be cooled. And that, uh, and if you have another atom come in, they, you can undergo white assisted collision so that when you image, you can guarantee that you only have zero or one atom. And so it's a very powerful technique to start off uh, your experiment with either uh, zero or one atoms. And in Cindy Regal's group later, um, they showed by having um, two tweezers that you could uh, move relative to each other, you can, and, and, and cooling these atoms to the, the uh, ground state of the harmonic trap, that you could do some, uh, that you can uh, have very precise control over the atoms and the, the hopping in between these different lattice sites. And in, uh, in a, I do want to point out that this, um, this tweezer approach was used early on in the field that I did my PhD in with a coupling atoms to, to uh, photonic crystals um, by the Lucan group. And uh, it's now being used by, by Chen Lung's group here uh, on trapping uh, atoms near these, um, these resonator, ring resonators. There was a lot of excitement in the last few years uh, in this field uh, based on kind of an advance in the technology of, of these tweezers, which is uh, imaging, having in a 1D array of these tweezers, imaging in them, and then in about 100 milliseconds, um, well, imaging and then rearranging them so that you then have a uniformly uh, filled lattice and doing all this in about 100 milliseconds. And uh, really the approach, I mean, the advance here is just, uh, good programming, good computing, because you need to do all this imaging, uh, sending a signal to an AWG to, to control these um, traps is kind of a, was a pretty hard feat. Um, but this really does represent a, a change in, um, in paradigms in making uniformly filled lattices. You no longer have to get to these deeply degenerate regimes to get 100% filled uh, lattice. You can instead image where you have atoms, and like I mentioned, you can either gonna have, whenever you do a, a diffraction limit tweezer, you're gonna have zero or one atom, so you just image where they are, you image with very high, 99.9% fidelity, and then you just rearrange them very quickly. And now you have 100%, but you don't have to be at deep, uh, very low temperatures. And this technique has also been used, uh, spatial light modulators in 2D, even in 3D, and people have shown that they can rearrange these atoms into a lot of interesting shapes. And this is uh, now becoming a popular field with Rydberg atoms. Um, this is uh, what they're doing here in, in Lucan's group, um, where then they are studying Rydberg interactions between those atoms. But this paradigm can also be used for molecules because our goal is to have a uniformly filled array of the molecules. Um, this, tweezer, uh, this tweezer approach was uh, in a collaboration between Canquin's group at Harvard and uh, John Doyle's was last year, uh, realized to uh, be used for trapping calcium fluoride, for directly cooling into calcium fluoride. Uh, I'll also talk, I think I'll actually probably skip over um, my work at Harvard, uh, which was, was doing a uh, assembly in an optical tweezer where you have a, two individual atoms in your tweezer, sodium and cesium, you merge them together in the same trap, uh, and then you uh, magneto-associate uh, then do stair wrap all the way to the rotational ground state, which we did in 2018. Um, I think I'll probably skip over uh, just a description on how that's done. Although I will show, I love this video, it was just a single atom hopping in and out of our, in and out of our trap. Um, so we have the image of sodium cesium, and then we do uh, kind of, instead of doing this evaporative uh, cooling, we can just do something called Raman sideband cooling, where we can very efficiently get to very quickly, compared to evaporative schemes, get down to the ground state of these tweezers. So, uh, and we did that with very high efficiency in that lab. 
Um, and now we have, um, as, of, as of this year, a Magneto Association, and we now have um, to stair up all the way to the ro vibrational ground state. And this is, um, in this case, we were just doing it two atoms at a time. So uh, I now, in this last maybe like few minutes, talk about um, the, the lithium cesium experiment that we're starting in Purdue. There's one motivation for picking lithium cesium was that I think it work, will work really well for this tweezer scheme. A lot of the limitations that the other groups have experienced with lithium cesium and the ultra drilled gas approach don't really apply to this tweezer approach. And so I think uh, it's a really promising system to apply to. It has the largest dipole moment, but there's one really important uh, other uh, feature of lithium cesium on why I picked it, and that is uh, having to do with direct molecule imaging. Um, because in, if we cool, if we get a molecule in this rogue vibrational ground state and we want to do uh, imaging of that molecule, we're still going to need a Frank Kahneman factor close to one in order to do this imaging. And uh, in KRB, there was a proposal in 2014 um, by the NOE group uh, that showed that there was about 94% of the light, if you excite to this B triple, the ground state is B triple pi, would come back to your rogue vibrational ground state. Um, that's kind of borderline for imaging. Uh, but just Olivier, when I was trying to choose these molecules, talking to Olivier, he calculated it for all the bioalkyl lithium cesium is actually the best. And about 99.93% of that light will come back to the recreational ground state, which really means we're going to be able to do direct imaging on these molecules, which was very important to me. Uh, and so I think this is my last two slides. Um, I wanted to, to quickly talk about what is the, um, I, talk, I talked to you in the beginning about how it's very promising with molecules, the coherence times. Um, there's been an experiment that has showed the, a one second coherence time in sodium potassium and, and Martin Zwillian's group at MIT. But in the rotational coherences so far have been kind of underwhelming. Uh, they have a manual blocks group has uh, used some magic polarization techniques to get to eight millisecond uh, calcium fluoride and my target group uh, six milliseconds where is this uh, second long rotational coherence and the answer is the dominant the dominant defacing the experiments is because of this ultra cold uh, gas experiment where they just have a very large trap of these molecules and if you're in a large trap of molecules, then it is, each one is seeing a slightly different potential and you're gonna get very large and homogeneous quality. And so a, a short-term goal for, uh, not really a short-term, but a goal for my, experiment, my lab is to have two molecules in a tweezer and then start setting that rotational appearance and seeing really what that limitation is once we get rid of this dephasing due to these large trap sizes. And so uh, my final slide is just a, um, the experimental setup that we are um, building right now. Uh, this is a lithium cesium uh, experiment. We have um, uh, a lithium effusive microcapillary oven um, to launch the lithium atoms towards this glass cell here. Uh, then uh, we have a cesium dispenser to, to make the cesium. Um, we, are, we have these uh, thousand gauss um, Feshbach coils that we've made and tested and uh, that will be used for the magneto association and also used for um, a magnetic field for the Zeeman slower to slow down the lithium because um, lithium is uh, hard to cool at room temperature, um, at uh, room vapor, uh, vapor pressure at room temperature. So you need to use a Zeeman slower to cool it down. Uh, and then uh, we have a, a high uh, numerical aperture objective that will be used for to create the array. My plan is for about 100 tweezers to trap lithium and cesium. And then the, the final feature I don't really want to talk about is that in, in, at Harvard with sodium cesium, we took the all, um, we went all in on the optical tweezers. There's a lot of advantages to optical tweezers, but we also learned that there are some advantages for having a 3D lattice in your system as well, especially for doing sideband cooling and the magneto association. It's just easier to make the field, the optical fields more uniform. And so this experiment will be a hybrid between a quantum gas microscope with the 3D lattice. Um, and, and a tweezer array. So you can imagine starting with a tweezer array, reconfiguring it, loading it into a um, into a into the optical lattice, uh, and then doing some of the simulations, uh, quantum simulations in the, in the lattice. And I, 
I'm out of time, and I just wanted to point out that this is my research group right now. And so we have a, I have a, a postdoc, uh, Carl, who's been uh, building the vacuum chamber system, and a grad student, David, who's been working on all the computer control and, and some undergrads who are building a laser system. And that's the end of my talk. So thank you for your attention, and glad to take uh, questions now. Thanks so much, John. Um, sure. Yang had to leave uh, for a meeting at 11, but he sent me a couple questions he wanted me to ask you. Sure. Uh, he said you mentioned some good features of molecules for qubits. Can you make a comparison with other AM AMO qubits, especially ions and Rid Rydbergs? And then also, what is the ratio of decoherence time over gate time? Yes. Um, I, so I actually, I think I, I think I mentioned both of those. I can, um, I can say it again. Um, the uh, so a comparison to to Rigberg atoms. Um, Rigberg atoms have an advantage in that they have uh, a very large uh, van der Waals interaction and uh, can have extremely long range interactions by going to the, the, the high uh, excited highly excited Rigberg states. Um, a disadvantage with the Rigbergs is that these these excitations happen in short lived uh, excited states. Uh, the advantage in molecules is that they all, all these interactions are taking place in electronic ground states. Um, the, uh, so the fair comparison there is what just what Young was asking, which is a um, coherent, is the interaction time divided by the coherence time. In Rigbergs, because your dipole moment's larger, your interaction time is gonna be much faster, but then they have a decoherence, which is also much faster due to just the short-lived excited state. In molecules, it's kind of still an open question for what is the coherence time. Uh, I gave some arguments late, earlier about how the coherence time for if you just have a single molecule trapped, which hasn't been done yet, the coherence time uh, should be extremely large because there's nothing for it to decay to, the molecule can decay to. And so the limitation is predicted to just be the um, black body radiation exciting different vibrational states, which for lithium cesium is something like 60 seconds um, to go from a uh, V equals zero to a V equals one state in lithium cesium. Um, and so in that case, uh, I don't really know the exact ratio in the Rigberg uh, system right now, but uh, as I pointed out earlier, uh, for the interaction time divided by the, the 60 seconds um, is about a factor of a million. Um, there are other sources of decoherence maybe that will come up. Um, uh, the, there you have a, a microwave field which we can control really well. Uh, you have a magnetic field which you control really well, and then you just have the, the trap light. And that's really all, that's pretty much all the degrees of freedom in the system. Um, so I, we're very hopeful that uh, once you get just down to single, um, single molecules that we'll see some very long uh, coherence times. He also mentioned ions. The difference with ions is that ions are, yes, they have the electron charge, so they have a long range direction. But in a, in a gate with ions, they are, they are interacting through their, their um, the vibrational modes in the lattice they are. That lattice they're in and um, limitation. I think the highest fidelity ion uh, to, to ion gate so far is, is around 98%. Um, and it's difficult um, for the people who know a lot more than I do about this to imagine getting up to these 99.9%. And so, so molecules is, is just a, a new promising way, and we're just going to have to see what this decoherence is um, I, when, when yeah. we get down to single molecule. John, this is Chen Long. You just show a slide that uh, people are um, fighting um, decoherence, either in the hyperfine ground state. Uh, yeah, they show that uh, one second of coherence time or rotational coherence, they mean second. These are, I guess, are they, the, these are also relevant, right? Yes, yes. So, but what I, what I, uh, the, in this figure down here, what I was uh, trying to point out is that um, the dominant dephasing in all of these approaches so far is that you have a really large gas of atoms in a, uh, in a, in, in a dipole trap and each molecule is seeing a different potential. And so that's expected to be the, the limitation on these systems. That is not going to be a limitation for this optical tweezer approach uh, the, because we can make the, the tweezers the same or if we put it in the, in the, in the 3D lattice next to each other, they should, the molecules should see very similar, especially in a, in a 3D lattice, which is my, is my goal. Um, we take tweezers to move two atoms 
two molecules in neighboring states of a 3D optical lattice, they should see extremely similar optical potential. And so this, this, this dephasing that they've observed so far should not be important at all. Um, and so then the question is, what is the next source of dephasing? Um, and that's why I was mentioning the black body radiation in, in just about 60 seconds. So this, we just have to do this. We just have to, to study these molecules in, in smaller traps. Uh, John, I had a question. Chris Green here. Um, so in Jun Yi's uh, KRB experiment that you mentioned, uh, they claim that there is some unusual, some kind of many body suppression of collisions at low temperatures when yes. you go to a degenerate quantum gas. And my understanding is that that's probably not really true. And in, in a sense, it's more an enhancement of the reaction rate, at least compared to a thermal gas at the same temperature, um, because you freeze in the distribution of momenta, like in a, in a Slater determinant of, of different momenta states. But uh, that still leaves the question of how to interpret their losses as a function of temperature. Do you have any insight in, into that? Uh, uh, I, I don't think I have any uh, extra insight into the situation now, sorry. Yeah, I, I still think that's a rather unresolved uh, question. Uh, we have a preprint out on it, but I don't think that that solves it either. Oh yeah, I'll, I'll look for that. Um, it's, it's on the very, archive. Yeah, it's a very interesting topic. So, Chris, so I think your paper essentially emphasizes the trap effect, if my understanding is right, right? Basically, you and Anna Marie proposed that while well, combining the trap effect and the quantum signal effect, so somehow you will be able to observe the strong suppression of the chemical reaction at lower temperatures. Is my understanding yeah. of the paper Yeah, correct? well, the detailed models weren't really, uh, with the experimental parameters, weren't really uh, achieving agreement with the experiments. Um, one thing that was also invoked was the possible radiative effect on the uh, uh, composite state when, you know, the, the uh, state w when the two molecules stick together for some time. Um, but yeah, that, that was one hypothesis tossed out. But the, like I say, in the end, all the parameters you, you could sort of guess a parameter that would make it agree with experiment, but it didn't seem like that parameter was up the appropriate value. So I still think it's unresolved. Interesting. Mm -hmm. And so lithium cesium um, it is an active molecule, so it would be um, fun to do an experiment with that. Mm -hmm. Like KRB, you mean? Yeah. So John, so as you mentioned, uh, well, last year, well, there have been, well, there was a new work okay, to propose uh, the loss essentially comes from photon, right? Yes. But then compared to the, the, the sticky mechanism, this is actually a true body process instead of a three body one. Sorry, sticky mechanism, what did, you, what did you say? Basically, previously, okay, we yeah. thought that, uh, well, it has been conjectured that uh, Basically, well, the sticky collision. Sticky collision, yeah. Yeah, sticky collision produces a complex. And then, you know, so the complex can collide with another molecule, then they decay. Yes. But that is a three body process. Yes. But this newly proposed uh, photon induced loss is actually a two body process. Yes. So then I'm curious. So, presumably, from the numerical data, well, previously one should be able to see that, well, a uh, three-body decay cannot describe what's a decay, right? But for yes, so many uh, years, we thought that, well, okay, everything comes from this sticky collision. Yes, I'm just uh, curious. Uh, so in, in the uh, John Bones 2013 paper, he, he emphasizes that, yes, sticky collision is a three-body process, but if um, the time scale of the, um, of, uh, to the, uh, of the two molecules, sorry, of the reaction complex interacting with the molecules very fast, then it will actually look like a two-body process. And so it's just a question of the time scales of the uh, sticky collisions, uh, how, how often they react, um, compared to uh, how often uh, another mo molecule come a story. And so uh, it is a little confusing, but the, the three-body process can look like a two-body process. <laughs> 
I didn't understand this point. You mentioned that John, well, okay, basically, you said that if the three body decays too fast, then it looks like a two body one. How can I understand this point? Uh, My the, shape would be very different, right? But it's, it's really a sequence of two two body collisions, right? First, you have the stickiness, and then the collision with the third body. And if one of those rates is very different than the other rates, then it will end up. Uh, then it essentially is just a two-body effect. For example, oh. if, if every time you have uh, a, a, the two molecules form a, um, this reaction complex have undergo a sticky collision, if every time that happens, then you uh, have a third body coming in and reacting with it, um, then, then it will look like a two-body effect. I see, I see. So, I mean, one process should be much faster than the other. Okay, I see. Thanks. And, and the photon process, I disagree with your language sheet. I still view yes. that as a three-body process because the photon is the third body. Oh, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. You consider a photon also as a, <laughs> yeah, as a body. Yes, I agree. Yeah, okay. But just a, an uncommon question is, um, but in terms of density dependence, it will still look like two bodies scaling. Correct. Yes. Right. Yeah, of course, of course, for density scaling. Yeah. Any other questions? Well, thanks so much, John. Uh, appreciate your time and, and for presenting this morning. And thanks all for attending. Thank you. Thanks, John. Great talk. Thanks. See you all next week. Bye.